Welcome to another Saturday night and taking it to the nub. I'm your host, Boston Jimmy. And today and tonight, we're going to have a fantastic show with an amazing guest, Jeremy McDonald. Jeremy, you might know from Caldwell Cigars, but this year he has branched off on his own and he has created his own new cigar company called Wildfire Cigars. So I'm going to bring Jeremy in and we're going to get this show started. And we'll be talking about Wildfire Cigars and we're going to learn a little more about Jeremy himself. So let me just bring Jeremy in from the waiting room. Brother Jeremy, how are you? Excellent. I was just accepting the terms and conditions. On, on Zoom? Yeah, yeah. That's the first time that's ever happened. It was like you are consenting to this being recorded and oh, anything. Yeah. I was like, so yeah, I just signed away my, my first, uh, well, can't be my first child, that day. my third child. You can have the third one. <laughs> they haven't come yet, but when they do, they're yours. Yeah, I, I got two grandkids. I don't. I have two kids and two grandkids. I don't need any more little ones around me anymore. I, I love my grandkids dearly, and uh, I'm good. I, I, I'm getting ready for retirement. I just want to go enjoy life, settle into the sunset. I just told my wife today, coming back from dinner, I said, you know, it'd be a really cool thing to do in retirement: chase sunsets. Just travel around the country to find amazing lakes and water bodies that have big areas to the west where you could just sit and watch sunsets. That's pretty cool. Right? <laughs> it just spent a whole year just chasing sunsets. Be a great idea. I mean, uh, anyway, it's pretty satisfying. I think so. Um, <laughs> what are you uh, smoking tonight? Uh, I'm going with uh, the Revivalist. Oh. Uh-huh. I love that cigar, as you saw. I'm actually, this is the first time I'm firing up your uh, single. Oh, awesome. So I picked this one up also. It's been resting for a few weeks. I like the revival list. We'll see what this has to do. We'll get into talking about these cigars in a moment. Pairing it with anything? I mean, pairing by the the by means of, I went to my refrigerator and grabbed a beer. Uh, so it wasn't like a, uh, a, an intentional pair. It was just, I want to have a beer. So, uh, I'm drinking this here in Nevada celebration because it only, this, I drink it a lot this time of year because that's when it comes out. So you big beer it's not nerd? exactly, yeah, it's not a, I used to be a big like beer nerd and then I just, the same thing with cigars and then you kind of just settle into what you like and i realized like chasing all these white whales for what <laughs> yeah you know like it, it like i ended up i was actually talking with some buddies because i have this like uh wine fridge right but it's filled with all these like collectible beers from way back in the day and i was like i guarantee you half this shit has gone bad because i like <laughs> got into it when it was like a new thing and I'm like, I don't know how beers hold up for 15 years, you know, some of these, like, so like none of it was aged intentionally, you know, like cigars, you have a lot. So you just smoke and sometimes things just get left by the wayside. So I'm trying to figure out something to do with all these like old beers because like, you know, the last one I opened had turned and it was gross. And I was like, well, that was a waste. Yeah. but then again that was like 15 years ago so i don't think they have a shelf life that long that's why there's a date stamp on a lot of beers yeah but a lot of them now have the like drink after date and stuff because they're trying you know it's like such a like oh you sell her your beer but but how long you know everything turns eventually it's yeast yeah 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 <laughs> It's chemistry. <laughs> yeah. So let's, uh, I, I'm actually pairing mine with some black, black duck Duraf wine from New South Wales. Came in with uh, one of my wine clubs. Very plummy, very black, uh, black cherry in it. It's very pleasant wine. Wow. It's Sounds good. Yeah, it's not dry and. You know, it's got kind of more fruity wine, so hopefully this works okay. 
yeah if i was gonna i would have poured some uh whiskey but i haven't unboxed any of the stuff yet like if i actually wanted to sit i would have done something but my sierra nevada will work there you go <laughs> so jeremy um before we get into what you're doing with wildfire cigars there i'm sure there are some folks on this uh, watching this or will be watching it, they may not know necessarily who Jeremy McDonald is. So before cigars, who was Jeremy McDonald? I mean, it's gotten to the point where I've been into cigars longer than I haven't at that age. But I mean, before cigars, I mean, I guess I was an aspiring uh, musician and like went on the road in a van and didn't make it and in that way and realized that that is not the life I wanted to live. So I should get a real job. So then I found cigars. <laughs> <laughs> no. and, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but I mean, I, like I worked so many jobs, um, like most of the time, like between the ages of, I would say, 16 to like 25 I had so many jobs or I had multiple jobs simultaneously you know just what you got to do living in California to pay your bills and you know uh so I worked you know at gourmet grocery stores and stuff and I had started working when I was 20 at a, at a cigar retailer um just here and there and to fill in when their guys couldn't go i mean or when they had to like if they had a vacation or whatnot and it just little by little became more of a thing and uh eventually i left the other jobs and and, and just you know worked there for just shy of 12 years 11 years and then went on the rep side and you know, it just kind of like did the whole progression of like starting at the ground, you know, like sweeping floors, working my way up, you know, like, like what P Diddy did in the music industry. He started sweeping floors like a janitor. And now look at him. I mean. so, <laughs> and now look at you. Wait a second. I'll compare the two here. Uh, you, um, along that path, um, how did you connect up with? in the beginning with Robert Caldwell. So I was working with Christian Aroa under the CLE mm -hmm. brand. Um, and so I was the West coast, uh, sales rep. So, uh, under CLE, cause he had some, sub subsidiary brands. So like, so like you had the asylum, you had pure soul and you had Winwood. Mm -hmm. Winwood was, uh, his partnership with Robert Caldwell. Right. And so, because of the kind of cigar nerd in me, I really enjoyed the Winwood brand. So Rob ended up doing a lot of traveling out to the West Coast because like I was getting at some legs out here. And uh, through that, Rob and I just became friends. Um, and then when him and uh, Christian parted ways, you know, I was still in contact with him just because we had like, you know, developed a friendship. And when he decided to start Caldwell, he was like, you want to like jump ship? And I was like, hell yeah, let's do this. So it was, it was, it was definitely, uh, you know, like, he's like, well, wh what do you want your title to be? And I'm like, uh, let's be like a national sales manager. He's like, all right, sounds good. You know? And then I was like, I got to figure out what a national sales manager does. <laughs> <laughs> So, means you travel all over the country and you try travel, to build build accounts and hire reps to take care of them, right? Yeah. Yeah, but that part wasn't so bad because I had had experience with like management, you know, quite a bit of experience, but it was more so like doing projections and things like on, on the, the, you know, the back end on the business end that was very much a learning curve, like not knowing, you know, that's why you make friends so you can call them and ask them yeah hey, what, what, what should i be doing right here because i don't really like you know i had to grow into it 
I, it was certainly probably, you know, probably the most likable and worst uh, sales manager there was in our industry when I first started, you know, like everyone was like, oh, Jeremy, you know, we like you. And I was like, yeah, if I only knew what I was doing, you know, <laughs> but you figure it out, you know, trial and error. That's, that's yeah. Just- and and obviously it, it, it must have worked because, uh, you know, the Caldwell brand built up very nicely over the years. Um, lots of lots of interesting blends, lots of interesting projects that came out of out of Caldwell while you were there. Um, you know, he's got a cult following. Um, so it's it, it's it, it did very well. Um, and, uh, and you obviously learn, like you said, by the seat of your pants, how to do that. Yeah, yeah. It was definitely baptism by fire, you know, like, and uh, it, it, it's funny because like, I, you know, I can read all the books in the world, but I don't tend to like learn until like I was the kid that was like, you know, what's it like to put your hand on the fire? And then your parents are like, don't do that. It's going to hurt. And I'm like, but let me see. <laughs> and then I get burned and I'm like, okay, maybe I shouldn't do that. So that's how I... <laughs> that's like my whole entire life how i've learned like oh you made a bad decision that hurt okay let's modify let's try this again try not to do that again (laughs) yeah yeah so you go from so you recently announced now that you have um uh parted from caldwell i think you still have some relationship back to caldwell in, in that announcement um so you've created your own brand, Wildfire mm-hmm. Cigars. Now it all makes sense uh, with that with that <laughs> silicone. Wildfire Cigar, absolutely perfect name for yeah. you and your brand. <laughs> I didn't even think about it like that, but I think you're right. I think it, it does. <laughs> you know, it, it all kind of resonates with, with, with the story. Um, you connected with uh one of my favorite factories Hoya de Nicaragua um to do that how did you uh get that the relationship with Hoyo uh did you um did you have that before or is that something that you 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 knew Dr. Cuenca and I mean I had met them you know at at dinners um when I was a retailer but I had no I didn't have a relationship and what's funny is when I Um, reached out to them I wanted to go to them because like um, I wanted to separate and not make and produce cigars out of the Dominican just because I really wanted to kind of carve my own path so it wasn't like I was riding the coattails of what we had done with Caldwell Um, so I love that factory but I just wanted to like and I, when I was in that process of like, well, who would I want to go to? I was like, dude, it has to, I got to get Hoya on board. I got to get them to do it. And uh, so I was talking with a couple of factories, but I reached out to him and he knew of me um, as far as like who I am in the industry, but like, you know, with Caldwell, but he thought I, when I, you know, when I said, I want to make a cigar or cigars, plural, I want you guys to be the manufacturers, they were, uh, they thought I was trying to buy a lost and found for Caldwell. Ah. They were like, they were like, "Ah, we're not really interested in because, you know, and I was like, no, 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 no. (laughs) And it was like such a funny conversation, because I was like, no, no, like, I'm going to be leaving um, Caldwell. And and then their next response was like, well, we don't want to get in the middle of anything weird. Like, and I was like, no, 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 Rob's on the up and up. Like I've, I've had, a, he and I are, are good. And like, he, this isn't a surprise to him. He didn't know what factory I was going to, but I, we had had multiple conversations about me leaving to do my own, um, things. So it, like, they were like timid at first. And, uh, you know, and then we had a few phone conversations and it was like I was getting like vetted like into like the mafia or something because what I finally like they, they had this interview and then Juan calls me back, Juan Martinez, and and he's like, Jeremy, we are going to make your cigars. And I, I felt like I like should get like an Adidas warm up, you know, like I just got made. 
like it just felt like because it was such this like our family's going to make your product you know that <laughs> was awesome that is um, awesome <laughs> yeah and so i was like man i mean like i get to come out swinging you know i get to come like you know not that the, going to a small factory would be would mean that it's an inferior product but it's like i got some heavyweights to come out of the gates you know as a, as right. a newcomer behind me and uh i just love them and i think that they're like such an incredibly underrated factory and especially for what they've done in our industry as far as influencing styles of cigars but they're never really like the ones people are like oh like everything is like tapsis and Ar i mean argonos uh, and like like and the, they're great they're, like you know but and that's like where everything's coming out of. And I was like, Antonia. I just love the idea. Yeah. Antonia, man. I yeah, tell yeah. you what, that is one of my all time favorites out of Boy the Nicaragua. The whole line, but man, which one it is. Yeah. I mean, think about that like Dark Corojo, right? The Antonio yeah. Dark Corojo. That cigar is what now probably 15 years old, mm -hmm. and it's still stronger than 90% of what's on the market. Absolutely. Like, that's insane. But they also have like hybridized tobaccos that they have like and stuff that they use that like no one ever really thinks about. But like they were doing this stuff. Not only are they the oldest factory, like premium factory in Nicaragua, but they've been doing stuff that was cutting edge. It's just they're not the like they're not the showman. You know, they just do what they do as a family. And like they're very proud of what they do. And I, I was stoked and I am stoked to like work with them. So. So now you were, you've been quoted as saying, and I think this, um, I forget what this comes out of, but um, you were quoted as saying, another cigar on the market? Haven't we seen it all? Why would this guy make a cigar? He's not a cigar blender. All these things could and would be said about me as I re-enter the industry under my own brand, Wildfire Cigars. To say that, I say, fuck it. We have all lost... Have we all lost sight here? Explain. Well, I mean, that's a, a lot to kind of unpack, but I mean. What are the essence? My, my thoughts are, there are so many cigars and there are so many, like there's, there's almost this like, I don't want to say hierarchy, but like, you know, gatekeepers like, oh, who's supposed to have a line and who should have a line? And it's like, oh, this guy was a rep and now he thinks he can have a brand. And like, there seems to be a lot of criticism, um, not just on me in particular, uh, but what I've heard being spoken of other manufacturers over the past like decade, from manufacturers to even retailers like, oh, another line, another this, like, who does this guy think he is? And so that's why I just kind of got in front of it. I was like, yeah, yeah, all you guys are going to say this. And that's okay. Like, I don't, I'm not a blender. Uh, I love tobacco and I'm having something made to my specifications for what I enjoy to smoke. And it's a learning process, you know, like I have been playing with tobacco any opportunity I've gotten when I would go to the Dominican or wherever I've gone. Um, but it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's something you have to learn, you know, and like there, there's just this perception of like, it's another brand, it's another this. And I was like, yeah, but I think that we could like use it. I think that, um, having you know if i was kind of summarize like the ethos of like you know why i called the brand really why i called it like wildfire um it's not actually because i'm in southern california and we're always on fire even though i think that's funny that's not actually uh why but it's the whole concept of like sitting around with someone having a conversation you know thinking I love outdoors. I love camping, you know, and I love sitting under the, the stars with it. And it doesn't matter what cigar I'm smoking. It doesn't matter what I'm drinking. It completely matters who I'm with and that, and that moment we have. And, you know, I kind of want to just cut through the like, 
yeah, 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 yeah. Like the cigar, if you like it, cool. If you don't, cool. We can still have a cigar together and still have, you know, I've had great cigars that were ruined by bad experiences and I've had really shitty cigars that are some of the most memorable just because of where I was, you know, you talk about that, like chasing sunsets, that'd be a hell of a way to have a cigar, you know, like those are going to be the best cigars you ever had. <laughs> Smoke a cigar on every sunset crossing the country. I, I would love yeah. to do that retired. That would be awesome. Be a whole new block. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me take a quick, uh, quick, quick break here. I'm just going to give a quick shout out to the sponsors of the show today. And when we come, when I come back, um, I want to dig into the, uh, the wildfire blends, the, the single, and, and the revivalist and, and talk about how they came to be. Um, so today's show is brought to you by this. There we go. All right. Today's show is brought to you by La Jolla Del Chan. La Jolla Del Chan is a dream come true for husband and wife Gabby El Chan and Liz. They want all hands that work the tobacco leaf in their home country of Puerto Rico to have the same opportunity to expose their products. They call it La Jolla Del Chan because they cultivate part of their product and at some point want to be able to supply the world with their native tobacco leaf. The pride that Gabby and Liz feel is the same pride of all those who work the tobacco leaf and for this, they deserve a portal that represents them. They want to thank everyone for supporting their country. We will resist, they say. You could follow them at www.lahoyadelchan.com and at El Chan Cigars on Instagram and Facebook. Today's show is also brought to you by Platinum Nova Cigars. Platinum Nova Cigars is a family-owned and operated premium cigar company. Only the highest vintage tobacco and the most skilled hand workmanship go into the making of each Platinum Nova cigar. This results in a timeless blend of art and craftsmanship. The Nova brand and the family's work are a tribute and an honor to their grandfather to always remember him and his infinite passion for the finest cigars. The love for the cigars they have started with their grandfather, a dedicated master blender and entrepreneur in the cigar industry. The next time you're looking for an exquisite cigar experience, pick up a Platinum Nova. You can check them out at www.novacigar.com and on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also go to their site and while this ad is running and put in the code BOSTONJIMMY15 and you'll get 15% off your purchases. Today's show, lastly, is brought to you by Rodriguez Cigars. Rodriguez Cigars is the oldest cigar factory in the Florida Keys. Founded in 1984, Rodriguez Cigars goes back generations into Cuba, where they originally started planting their tobaccos and brought it over to the, over the United States once the Cuban crisis happened. Um, they stand the old, they, they're the oldest manufacturer in the Keys, preserving the historical cigar manufacturing industry that began in Key West in 1831. As the years pass, new generations of family members have expanded manufacturing operations to Nicaragua, and they are proud to be working with some of the finest tobacco in the world. Rodriguez cigars are exclusively constructed with vintage leaves that have been hand-selected, aged, and constructed through the traditional Cuban manufacturing process. The next time you want to check out a great cigar. If you're over in the Florida Keys, especially Key West, check out Rodriguez Cigars. You can look them up at www.rodriguezcigarskeywest.com. I'd like to thank my sponsors for without them, this show was always a little harder to do. Let's get back to Jeremy. All right. So you're not a master blender. You played with tobacco. You get a hold of one of the best places in the world, Hoya in Nicaragua. And the first thing you decided to do is create a cigar and you're going to call it the single, which is what I'm smoking yeah. now. First time I've smoked this cigar. Um, what was your process of doing this? How did you manage to get this blend and what is this blend in the end? So what's interesting is uh, I had had a blend worked out and ready 
to go that I was going to release out of a different factory as the single. Um, because I thought, hey, this would be really cool. Like, you know, I would like to use for all my core stuff and, and I'm sure some of the limited stuff down the road, but I want to use Hoya, but I wanted to like kind of showcase other, um, you know, factories and use other tobaccos. Like I don't, I don't want to make just one cigar and I wanted a cigar. I wanted to call it the single. I wanted it to be one size and a limited production because it's just like dropping a single like for music. And so like just sim, but I wanted it to show what I could do. Um, you know, like what, what you could be expecting from wildfire. Um, so I wanted it to be something special um and, and just unique um so that because of the bottlenecking in our industry is so bad right now and has been that project got pushed aside so i went to Juan and we started talking and i was like i can't take the blend from there and bring it over here so we need to find like we need to like begin working on something and uh this process was happening over covid so it started with um here are a few tobaccos that i i do know really well that i would like to incorporate or use and this is the profile i'm looking for and then they sent me samples and then uh everything they would send would be blind no information on the cigars just mm -hmm. numbered and uh so then it was like, well, I like three and I like seven, but they're not, you know, and I was like, so, and then, oh, okay, well, that's, you you know, using such and such wrapper. Okay, cool. We've got the wrapper. Let's go, like, go for the binder. And then, so then more samples. And so it just, it basically was a whittling down of like, until we got to um, what, and this, this was, the same process for both of the blends mm. just very di i wanted very different things out of both of the cigars um because i wanted the single to be more refined i wanted it to show some elegance i wanted it to have nuances and be more like a connoisseur's cigar versus like i wanted the revivalist to be like gritty and a little rougher and like a cowboy smoke in my mind mm. you know like um so it was, it was essentially a whittling down of, and then getting to the, you know, okay, we have the wrapper binder filler. It's too sweet. Okay. So then modifying that. And it basically what should have taken, you know, and I'm not saying a blend would only have taken one or two trips there. It could have taken four or five, but um, it took a much longer process because there was all this wait time in between and then I have to let it rest and then I have to see how it is and then they have to make modifications because sure. I couldn't actually get to Nicaragua so um so yeah like the single I wanted it to show and uh, originally the single was going to come out and then like you know a month or or so later the revivalist was going to launch but um just because of all the bottlenecking that's going on, it was like, you got to release them both at the same time, or we're looking at, you know, a three month gap in between. And I was like, no, it's like too much. Right. So, so I just put them out simultaneously. Um, I went to the, uh, I went to the trade show, but not as like, uh, to kind of just see, because I hadn't launched yet. So I didn't have product, didn't have, um, but Illusione is handling my, my fulfillment. So I went to the trade show just to kind of see them and, and just keep some relevance and talk to friends that I, you know, retailers that I had cultivated relationships and basically was like, hey, soon I'm going to have something and soon, you know, and then I can, you know, like, I'd like to talk to you about, you know, the cigars once they come in and I'll get you samples. So um, it was basically just to kind of stay uh, like 
in their ear, you know, like her yeah. state, you know, it wasn't, wasn't, uh, and, uh, so then once the, the product came in, then it was, all right, let's send out all these samples and get stuff out to guys and, you know, and, and, and start this whole, this whole and, ruckus. And, and the, and the process obviously worked somewhat because, um, I was introduced to this brand by walking into my local brick and mortar here, executive cigar shop and lounge in Melbourne, Florida. And um, the owner there, he's very picky at what he brings in. And when it comes to small brands, he's very concerned about, you know, you know sustainability and all of that. Um, and it has to be a cigar he likes, otherwise it's not going on the shelf. Um, and I walked in one day, I always ask if they have anything new. And the tobacconist goes, have you tried wildfire cigars? I said, you have those? He goes, yeah. I said, well, for sure, let's, let's try these. And I remember firing up the Revivalist um, while I was there. And I was like, wow, I kind of like this cigar. Um, I'll buy another one of those. And let me get one of these. And, and I'll probably buy another one of these because I got to review this because I'm liking this cigar also. And there is a there is a nice sweet nuance still in this that I'm getting on the, always on every puff, but there is this character I'll call almost call a characteristic uh, Hoya de Nicaragua flavor running in this. There's a very characteristic mm -hmm. flavor that is uh, Hoya. And um, yeah, so I'm liking this. Um, the, the blend on this is what? So that is an Ecuadorian dark Habano uh indonesian binder and nicaraguan filler predominantly like uh why am i blanking not esteli um jalapa jalapa yeah okay. jalapa. That's what I thought. yeah which is oh, very yeah. much there like and like when i got into cigars this goes back to um i got into cigars in the late 90s and like the tail end of the boom, right? But when you smoked Nicaraguan cigars back then, they weren't upfront, peppery, spicy, bold. Like they were earthy and like yes. cocoa and rich. And it what they weren't necessarily strong, um, but it just had this distinctiveness. And that and I fell in because Nicaraguan cigars to me were like Hoya and Padron, right? right. And so I smoked a lot of Hoya classics, which is funny. That cigar is not even, it's not in the U.S. It's still made for the um, international market, but it's not. But they, don't like, those, they didn't like the heavy bowl, piper, pepper and everything. They right. were Cuban-esque kind of flavor. Yeah. And I, and I love that just deepness that you get. It's not about strength. It's about deep, you know, deepness of flavor and it's rustic, you know, and I do smoke a lot of, you know, for lack of better words, more modern Nicaraguans, right? And I, and I love them too. But I was like, dude, I want to make throwback stuff that like, because that's what I got into, you know, and it's like, and if I like it, there's got to be someone else that likes it too, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so I mean, you know, there's always going to be people that don't, and that's cool. They they can smoke what they smoke, you know, and like, but, I, you know, you, you certainly can't reinvent the wheel, but it's like, in society, we keep like, you know, teens are wearing high-waisted, like, mom jeans now from the 80s and stuff, so why can't I go back to, like, you know... <laughs> Oh yeah, like I mean retro that, style like Nicaraguan cigars. Retro it's, cigars, it's, there you go. So now the 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 second one, the revivalist, and let me just pop up this, but we'll, so we'll talk a little bit about this. But so I did review that one, and uh, this one, I gave this a ninety three. All right, I really enjoyed this cigar. Um, it. It is more, first of all, it's a little more rustic looking than this one. This one is a much smoother, uh, you know, less veiny, less bumpy wrapper, right? This one's got a little, little of that rustic look to it, okay? Um, I got some nice notes in this of dry fruit, malt, 
a natural sweetness. It had this peaty note that I got, like from a single malt, a good single malt Isla Scotch. And I was like, this is good. I have to get another one and I'm going to just get a bottle of Lagavulin and just see how that works together. All right. Because I think it'll go well. It had some raisin and spice. So I, I love your descriptions better than mine. I'm, I'm, I'm going to steal your flavor flavor profile because it have sounds added. like it's all yours. it sounds so good. But I do I get it's interesting, like the raisin and things like, you know, because we pick up flavors based on like experiences, right? Like whatever our palate or whatever we've been exposed to, then that becomes something we can have in our repertoire to use. And like, I don't eat raisins um, unless they're in an oatmeal cookie, but like, I totally see that, you know what I mean? Like, I just have never used that as a descriptive of it, but yeah, I get it. Nice ash. I mean, this ash carried very nicely, solid down through the, beyond the first third, had a beautiful burn cone at the end, nice and scented, didn't have any issues with it, right? Picked right back up and this thing just, you know, then this is kind of how those flavors came in, man. It just started off with this natural sweetness and a kind of a spicy dry fruit in the beginning. And then it poured out smoke too, man. It was a smoke producer. I mean, so it filled your palate. You didn't have any problem with filling your palate. And then it jumped into those malt, the peaty notes. And then you kind of got this pleasant, and I describe it as not in your face spice. It was just a nice little spice tone coming in that wasn't smacking you in the head, you know, and then you get a little raisin in the midway. And then the finish was very clean on it. And then it got into this cream notes with some citrus started building up. Um, and I get that a lot in, in the Hoyo cigars. I get that mm -hmm. citrus note coming in. Um, and then it had this light spice and sweetness down to the final. Good one hour, 40 minute smoke. Love it. Think it's great. Price point. Your price points are, are dead in the, 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 uh, the, the wheelhouse of people. 10 to $12. I think yeah. you go wrong on that price. So um, how, many, um, how many of these have, have you produced on these lines? Um, as far as bo boxes or quantities so far? So with the single, I did 750 boxes and it's a 10 count. So I did 7,500 cigars and that was it. Um, and, and like I said, that was a one-time make. And I have a few boxes left of that, but more so like what I'm keeping in reserve for me, I sold what I wanted to do out of that. And then um, not just for me personally, but like, I'm a fan of like being able to like bring something up, you know, like say I'm, you know, say it's a year from now and I'm doing an event or two years that I can bring some of that stuff out, um, you know, just to kind of like spice things up and have fun with it. Like, so I wanted to hold 50 boxes was what I was like, uh, 50 will give me like, I can do some fun stuff with that. So I did 7,500 of those. And then I did um, my initial order on the Revivalist. There's three Vitolas, 20 counts. And it was 350, 350 and 300 boxes. Um, so essentially, you know, so a thousand boxes on, uh, was my introduction with with the revivalist. And they have how you how many shops have you gotten these into so far? So I closed. Um, I wanted to do like twenty five to thirty accounts to start with. Um, got to thirty two accounts, and then I'm putting a hold on opening up any other accounts um, until. One, I could see, because, you know, when you're making something that's new, you have no basis on how to, like, make a projection. And the last thing I wanted to do was come out and then overextend, which is, like, from the, you know, the good thing about learning from your mistakes is that's what Caldwell did. Mm -hmm. When we sold, you know, way more than we thought we were going to sell, 
And then we were back ordered for almost nine months and it almost killed the company in our first yeah. year of business. So um, learn so you hand on the fire anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I already I already got the burn. So I definitely so I capped it and then I've been essentially building a uh, like a wait list, you mm -hmm. know. So I've had retailers reach out to me, especially as like the cigar is getting out there and also just guys I had built relationships with over the years that weren't necessarily in my first gear, like who I was going to go to, but they would have been in the next. And, um, and I'm super thankful I did and capped it because, uh, you know, I'm sitting here telling these guys like, hey, I'm going to make sure you have product and I'm supporting it. Like I'm supporting you and I want to make sure your pipeline can get filled. So I want to do this methodically and smart. And even then the back order, you know, my second PO went from three months to six months. Sure. And so I'm probably still going to run out of product. And like, it's, it's just something I'm ha like, there's things in your control and there's things out of your control you know, and small brands, that's, you know, anybody that is legit in this business, understand small brands are going to go through that. You're going to do it right and not rush. Okay. We don't like the product rushed out just because there's a demand. And then suddenly it's no longer the product that you had before. I've heard the stories from many shop owners who tell you that the rep comes in, Hey, it is the cigar. He buys the cigar. Next thing you know, the cigar comes in because it's not the same cigar he smoked. <laughs> what happened to the cigar? Well, we ran out of this leaf, and I was like, "Well, I'm not buying it. Cancel the order. Take it all back." Okay? Yeah, yeah. Cigar sucks now. <laughs> you know? One, well, one of the things I noticed too is like, so the revivalist is being rested, like after rolled, I think 35 days. But now I want to push that to like 50 or 60 because I think that the, the revivalist. Um, really benefits from an, a little bit more time of resting mm -hmm. um it just it smokes better it smokes more balanced it's just you know and that's the thing you have to kind of test it as you go and see where right. that sweet spot is like what what i want to ship out is i want someone to walk grab it off the shelf light it and they've got the experience that they should have with it right so then it's like okay so like now we have to modify that schedule a little bit, you know, and, and anticipate for that extra time resting because it definitely plays a role into that cigar, you know, sure. just to to give the best presentation, you know, especially as a new brand. So many people, it's their first in experience with my cigar at this point. So it's like you really want it to be the best that at least I can present, you know, whether they gravitate towards my style of cigar or not that's subjective but i want it to be the best version of what my would represent right. wildfire your, your representation of what you think is the best exactly. yeah um on the side of the band on on the single and i don't know if i noticed this on the other one maybe it's on that too but it probably is you have two taglines on here one is leaves burn and the other side says stories live So you're making a statement here with, with this. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. What I had touched on is like the, the, the experience you have, like the, the connecting with a person have far more weight than like this. Like, you know, if I sit here by myself or I sit here with you or someone else and I smoke it, once you smoke it, the cigar is gone it's done burn you know there's nothing more of it but you do have the the stories and the memories and the life experiences that far those are the things that like really matter and uh you know it's it's like twofold i'm making a statement to kind of be a reminder to anyone like hey man like enjoy your experiences like enjoy take the time because like that's what matters, you know, and it's, and it's a reminder to myself to just like, don't get caught up in all this bullshit. Like, okay. just like, just work hard, do your thing. Like, you know, those, the people that are gonna, you know, like 
there was a review that came out and it was like so so and he kind of knocked it and i'm like sitting there with my ego and i'm like ah dude who cares not everyone's gonna dig this man like let it like you don't need to say nothing it's his opinion and it's right for him you know what i mean like that's okay you know it doesn't mean i did something wrong because someone doesn't enjoy it now if it was burning horribly and it's poorly constructed well that would be something that's a manufacturer issue but i don't have to worry about it because i'm dealing with Hoya. you're dealing with quality manufacturing right Small. like i the trust i know that they're not going to let something leave i mean it's a handmade product so there's always going to be a slip up no matter what oh, cool. but but their level i've been at their factory i've watched and it's like I don't have to worry about that element. You know, that, that's why I set up the company the way I did. Hoya's producing the cigars and then I'm doing the selling of the cigar and the brand building. And then I have Illusione warehousing and doing my fulfillment for me. So I don't have to worry about boxing it up and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. It's just, I can just focus on what I need to focus, focus on. Focus on getting it into shops and getting it into the hands of consumers. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to take another quick little break. I'm going to go through really quick what's new in news and reviews on Sogi Press this week. And when we come back, I want to dive into the stories live part because I'm going to ask you some questions and you're going to we're going to dig into some of your some stories that you probably have that would be most interesting to the viewers. Sure. <clears throat> um, so this past week on Sogi Press, we've had we did. I did three reviews. The first one is the Romeo and Julieta Eternal Toro. Came in in the 91. Uh, this cigar here is new for this year. Uh, it's a $15 cigar. It's made by Placencia for them. It's a Nicaraguan Puro. Um, it's got a really nice flavor profile with some dark chocolate and dried fruit. It's got a nice little honey note that was in it. Some natural sweetness, nut, pepper, raisin, spice. So it has a decent amount of complexity. Um, it did have uh, so a, a mild jag in the burn. Um, and it did have a slight off burn in the first third, but it didn't need any touch-ups for that. Um, so this is one that I, I found decent for it. It comes in a, a single 6x54 Toro, and it's packaged in 11-count boxes. Um, the second... Uh, review I did was on the La Flor Dominicana 25th anniversary. This came out late 2019, actually. So I I got it in 2020. I finally got around to it. This is a rugged looking cigar, without a doubt, very veiny. Um, I always tell people, though, ignore the fact that there are veins. Veins are flavor. They provide nutrients to the leaf. So there is nutrients that provide flavor. So never be afraid of what it looks like. Just think Connecticut broad leaves and the Pennsylvania broad leaves. They're ugly wrappers, but they are very tasty. Um, <clears throat> this particular one, though, is an $18 cigar. All right. Uh, flavor wise, it was getting cedar, got a little cherry note in it. Um, again, some dark chocolate and dry fruit had nice floral notes coming from it, off the, especially off the foot and the aroma. Uh, there was a natural sweetness and nut, pepper, and spice came through. Uh, the issue with this one was the burn. This had a very wonky burn through the journey. There was plenty of ash drops. It had a flaky ash. I was touching it up. So it lost a lot on just, you had to maintain this cigar and, um, unfortunately, I, I, I dig heavy on, on burn qualities of cigars, so I just don't want to have to struggle with the cigar, even though it might be flavorful, okay? I don't want ash falling on me all the time. So, and at $18, I expected to probably a slightly better burn on it than, than what it was doing. So that's, uh, that was that one. And then the last one, uh, which I just put out, is the, the new Oliva Siri V. 135th anniversary. This is a Perfecto. Now, this is a unique Perfecto. They call this a Perfecto, but it's not what you normally think of. So it's got this huge head on it. This is the cap. So if you ever buy this cigar, people, remember, you cut this and you light this. <laughs> you don't do it the other way around. 
it kind of makes you think you're going to do it the other way around, but no, you do not do that. Um, very unique uh, Vitola. Uh, this one was really complex, full strength. It's a ten dollar cigar. All right, they are they are a limited uh, quantity that they've made of these. They come in these. They come inside of these beautiful boxes. Okay, but they laid out. So the, the presentation is fantastic on this. Um, it's got an Ecuadorian wrapper with a Nicaraguan binder and filler. But the flavors on this, man, you get hit with this cayenne pepper. You got cedar and dark chocolate and leather. You got sweetness and more uh, like black peppers and white peppers and spice and toasted caramel and woody notes. And things are just swirling around and blending and playing so well together. You would think these things are like going to fight, but it just kind of evolved so beautifully, starting off with a kind of a medium strength, if you will. And it just got at the end. It was a full strength cigar. It burned, it burned beautifully. Um, it's just, it, this is a really nice cigar. So from an Oliva V perspective, if you're an Oliva fan, especially if you're a V fan, um, I think this is the best V I've had um, from Oliva, other than the, you know, to push the Milano out for a second, just the standard V line. This is a, a very special cigar. So carried a beautiful ash, nice ash cone, came down, kept that line straight pretty much. So um, definitely check that one out. Uh, from a uh, news perspective, uh, it was a very light week on news. Seemed like last week there was a whole bunch. We had two things. We put out the uh, archive uh, last week's show with Lars Tetons. That's out on the uh, Stogie Press YouTube channel now. You can always click the article and it's embedded inside of that if you want to watch that if you haven't. And then uh, Drew Estate has now announced that they're shipping their 20-acre farm um, 20 Acre Farm is a cigar that they created with uh, Jeff from Corona Cigars and his small farm, uh, Sun Grown Farm here in Florida. They use a little bit of that leaf in that. So those are now shipping to uh, retailers. So if you haven't had one, you want to check it out. Um, they should start showing up in all the Drew Estate retailers. <clears throat> so that's news and reviews on Stogie Press. Uh, let's talk stories, man. So... so this is the fun part of the show. <laughs> By the way, I wanted to show you this. I'm gonna move it just because, like my, I well, you can't. It, I'm missing the this the, but I got my ah, sunset going right now. Yeah, man, that's beautiful. It's where are you? Where are you in Cali? I'm in Orange County, South Orange County. Okay. But like I'm at I'm at the foothills of like the canyon, so like, yeah. I mean, the tree line, there's a big tree and I can see through it. They're like bright oranges. So like, you know, that's where the, it's like right behind that is where I can see the full sunset. But ah, I love, I love the sunsets in California without a doubt. I'll be out there actually in June. My niece slash goddaughter is getting married and they're having their wedding at the uh, in Laguna Beach at the ranch. That'll be beautiful. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to that. 200 people yeah. will have a blast. So looking forward to it. Um, let's go back to the discussion you, you, in the beginning when we talk, talked about um, things you did before cigars, one of which was mu was music. Um, I, and I saw that, you know, when you sent me the photo to make the badge for the announcement, you have your, your beautiful Marshall stack and your guitars. Um, what was the name of your band? was or is, is I still play okay, is or you know at you know um so i mean i've been in a variety of uh bands over the years but um the one i'm in right now is called louder's the roar so and that's uh my office slash you know um where our band practices and we have a setup like our our makeshift recording studio that we do. Um, and so, I, I mean, I play, I play a lot. It's, but it's, uh, it's for my own sanity, you know, like I, I, I don't, I don't like, we do play out, um, but it's for fun. You know, it's like a night out and your friends come out. I like practice getting drinks, free drinks and some couple of dollars. Yeah. Away. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're certainly not, you know, trying to get on the, like go on the road and do that. We all have our jobs and our, and, 
it's not a hobby. I mean, it's definitely like more a part of me than probably anything else. But there's also a reality attached to like, you know, it's not going to be my main source of income. So it kind of frees it, you know, so you just get to enjoy it um, and enjoy creating, you know, like. Sure. So, sure. yeah, that that's a fun, that Marshall gets loud. I, I bet it does. My son's got one of those. I bought them years ago. So I, I know that I actually had to get him new tubes, new power tubes for it, which was, uh, which was fun because I actually had an old, I had a box of tubes that I, somebody th- was throwing away like 30 years ago and I'm an electronics guy. So I just collected the tubes and I said, what, go take the tube out, read the number on it. And I looked in this box and I valued it brand new, that 30 years old but never used sylvania tubes right i mean you can't find those those don't exist they're czechoslovakian or whatever you got to buy them from so he's put those tubes in his amp he says it never sounded better oh i bet i (laughs) bet having the warmth of that just completely changed yeah that's pretty uh, impressive but let's talk a little bit let's dig a little deeper into the music thing so you were talking about, you know, you originally you were driving all over the place and you realized, okay, this is not going to work. What is like, your, give me like your, your, one of your funniest stories of, you know, on the road, with the band, <laughs> going to a club or something. It, it, just entertain us with a good story. All right. Because we're burning So <laughs> I was playing a show on New Year's Eve and I was probably like 24 at the time. And I was playing in a band. Uh, I I play. I grew up playing in like punk and metal and hardcore bands. Like the the angrier and more aggressive, I was into it. But you know, then you start not being so angry at the world, right? And uh, so I was playing in this band that's like just kind of a a rock band, pop, like whatever. And uh, we were talking together. And I was like, hey, this would be really funny if we all stage dove because no one would expect that coming from this music, you know, and they're like, all right. And so we had this like point in which we planned like, okay, when we get to this riff on this like song, we're going to stage dive. And it was at a, the show was a stage was built in like a, a gymnasium, like a basketball court. So it was raised. So it gets to this point and I run and I jump off the stage backwards, head first, and I part the Red Sea and I land on my head. I snap my guitar. I get hospitalized for three days because I had a I had a concussion because the stage was probably like five and a half feet tall. So I jumped and like people just (laughs) And uh, yeah, and so I had I have a history of concussions to begin with. Uh, I've had eight concussions, and uh, yeah, so my brain was swelling, so I had to get like I had to stay there so that they could like drain it. And um, yeah, like that was the last time these feet jumped off of something. Um, but I still have the souvenir I got, which was my my bandmates got myself a bicycle helmet and they all signed it and they wrote stage diving helmet for Jeremy. And I, I have it like hanging up, you know, because I think it's just, it, it makes me laugh because like <laughs> sure. I was the only one that went through with it, but I was, I paid a dear price for it. Uh, well, I mean, my guitar, still the, here. the neck just snapped Ow. on my, and, and it just like, but that one, uh, and it, it's, hilarious because we were real excited to play with the headliner and it was like I was hoping to get to talk with them and you know well I didn't obviously and I like killed the show I guess it like didn't really go on because like you know the medics were there and it just broke the whole thing up so then years later my friend that I was in the band with who's a drummer was uh, on tour with another band and it happened to be that that same group and he was trying to like bring to remembrance like hey we've played together before and the guy was like i don't know and he's like wait maybe you'll remember our guitarist jumped off stage and he was like 
oh yeah 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 so i was the common ground for their their newfound friendship from 15 years ago because they remembered some stupid kid you know jumping off of a stage backwards when he should not have i'm gonna <laughs> dig into another story that, that, that that's a good one that's good now i'm gonna dig into another story more recent and maybe you can give an explanation because i never really got the explanation so it was probably three pcas ago right mm -hmm. and i think this happened four pcas ago but more advanced three pcas ago what was with the toilet paper and mambacho as i mean <laughs> what was going on between you guys so there was just like it started off when Rob was in Nicaragua and he tagged Mombacho with a bunch of uh, he tagged Mombacho with a bunch of Caldwell stickers, their factory. And he thought it because he thought it was funny. And then they got like irritated by that. But Claudio has such a good sense of humor, like he understood it. So it they were like, okay, well, we're gonna get you. And so they like retaliated and at the trade, the PCA, they covered our booth with stickers. So this whole thing ended up like escalating. So then the next year we're like, what could we do? And we're like, hey, let's let the show close, the floor close. And then what we'll do is we'll go toilet paper their whole booth and then we'll take a picture mooning, you know, everyone. And um, so we, we waited till everyone left the show floor and we started toilet papering it. And then the security came over and they were like, you, what are you doing? You can't do this. And we're like, no, 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 no. It's our friends. It's fine. And we like convinced them. And so like we had, they were concerned for their job. So they were taking pictures of us while we were doing it. Um, and then what's funny that like didn't get talked about is like their display booths, like Rob exchanged, like they didn't lock their display booths. So we took out the Mombacho boxes and put Caldwell boxes. <laughs> yeah. I... <laughs> and, and like, and then the cigars we were smoking in the picture were on Mombachos. Like we just lit them up and we're like, let's smoke their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just for pure like enjoyment. And then they retaliated the next day. Oh, with... yeah, Cause it was the next, it was, you did that on the, last long day so pca yeah. always has a short the last day is a short day so when we all came in to the floor the first thing we saw was this toilet paper booth and everybody's mm -hmm. just scratching their heads going and everybody you know all needy guys were all like they're taking pictures it's like what the hell is going on here yeah and then we posted the picture in the morning of us like the on Instagram under the Caldwell thing of us doing the toilet papering. And so then they ended up writing this like little thing up saying, go over to the Caldwell booth at such and such time. They'll be introducing a new cigar called like the donkey dick or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. And so we wouldn't have known about it, but I came across one. Someone had dropped one of the things. So I got a heads up to it. And so I came back and I'm like, dude, they got to, they, they're going to come back with something good. So that was our first year. I think first year we had taken on the distribution for room 101. Oh, okay. So Matt yeah, had a right. new cigar. Matt hit out with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. So we took one of Matt's cigars and debanded it. And we were like, as fast as we could, we were writing like donkey dick on it, you know? And like, so then all of a sudden it was like, you know, noon, and there was like 50 people around our booth waiting for, and them not knowing that we got advance notice of this. And so they're waiting to like, you know, unveil this like joke. And we had a bunch of cigars and we, and Rob gave a little speech about how he appreciated how Mombacho does advertising for us and brings people to our booth. <laughs> Uh, it was hilarious, um, but it was all in good fun, but it was also just like, yeah, like, let's just have some like fun, man. Like, I mean, there's manufacturers 
there's friendships beyond you know oh, yeah. in, in the the backgrounds and, it, and it's fun to just like kind of play with it a little bit just have some fun you know like let's the show can get it's exhausting it's tired you know it's all this like let's just not make it so serious you know so like th that would continue have continued on for probably years to, oh and then when we the one that the next thing we did was at the Rocky Mountain Cigar Fest. Oh, I don't know about this. Uh, Mombacho. <laughs> so following the trade show, uh, Mombacho was the main sponsor of the Rocky Mountain Cigar Fest. So at a certain point in the day, they had like the main um, pavilion that they were going to do a talk about their cigars and such. And so when they left their booth unattended, except for one of their reps, we went up to their booth and we were like, we need you to turn an eye. And he was like, what? And we're like, so we took all of their swag and we started handing it out at Caldwell. So you buy a box of Caldwell and you get a free Mombacho cutter and a free Mombacho t-shirt. So by the time they came back, they had no merch left, but because we, and we were wearing their stuff as well. We were wearing <laughs> Mombacho stuff. But the thing is, is, I mean, their stuff still went out to the people, you know what I mean? Like, but I mean, it's just like, that's just kind of fun to do, you know, like, I mean, it has to be the right relationship because sure. we weren't, it was never like vindictive or like angry or, it, you know, like it was all in good fun and, and they're good sports, really good was, sports about that's it. That's great. That's great. So I didn't know all the background on it. Now I do. That's all that matters. Everybody else does too. So that's fantastic. Thank you for that story. Leaves yeah. Yeah. Are burning. Leaves are burning. <laughs> birds are being told. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's do a little, uh, little lightning round before we close this out. Um, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, a firefighter. Yeah, definitely wanted to be a firefighter. What was the worst vegetable in your life? Maybe mm. still is. It still is canned spinach. My parents love <laughs> serving us canned spinach. And I don't think you can call it a vegetable because I'm down with like fresh spinach. And oh, yeah. like it's a, I grew up hating it because it, it's like, you know, but I watched a lot of Popeye, you know, and so I was like, I would try to choke it down, but it just, it's like dirty feet. Like it's just disgusting. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't do canned spinach. Yeah, my, you know, my, my mother was the, the old school boiled everything anyway. So like asparagus boiled mush, mm. broccoli boiled mush. I hated all of that. And then I discovered yeah, yeah. I'm with you. properly made vegetables are awesome. <laughs> asparagus is one of my favorite things to grill. One of my favorite vegetables. Absolutely. But I, I, I know exactly what you're saying. Cause like, our vegetables, they weren't, they were, they were all canned. And mm -hmm. it was just like, this is just a gross way to eat them. There's, there's no texture. There's no crunch. There's no, yeah. yeah. Canned string beans we had. It yeah. <laughs> just nasty, nasty. So it took me a little, many, many years to discover food properly. And then once I got out of the house and I really discovered food, I was like, oh my God. Like my mother used to make fish on friday and it was flounder all right okay so in new york it's called flounder other places it's probably called cod or whatever but it's just a fishy fish it was a fishy fish right mm -hmm. and i and i hated this stuff and i hated because of that i hated fish and then years later i learned about real fish and i went from hating fish to to as far as eating raw fish fish eating sushi going man i love this stuff <laughs> right? so it's all about the preparation you know you smoke crappy cigars you may hate cigars suddenly you right the real thing and you're like oh what rock have i been living under <laughs> right so uh your face go back to music your 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 all-time favorite band tough one i know because we got lots of them but if you would have picked your number one band it is, and it, and it uh, periodically, like, you know, I listen to certain things more than others at certain times. 
probably CCR. I'm a, I'm a huge, like, I mean, Credence, just that, like, swampy, laid back, like, just rock and roll, and, like. And a sound uh, that was never been recreated. Yeah, and, like, it never gets old. You know, mm-hmm. it, it just never gets old. Yeah. Fogarty's voice and their musicianship. Yeah, they're probably my favorite band. Yeah. Mine's uh, Led Zeppelin. Always has been. Never saw him in concert. Never had the opportunity. But I'll tell you what. Two speakers on the side of my head when I was a kid, putting on it out, putting on the albums, or just listening to that, that earthy, gritty music that they put out. It was just oh, yeah. like, oh man, the guitar work and the drums from Bonham. It would just be like, ah, oh, this is so heavenly. You know, it's like people think I was crazy, but I, I love it. And my favorite all time Zeppelin song is the Lemon Song. The Lemon Song. The Lemon Song. You know that one? That's that I'm bluesy. Trying to... It's that blues, like a six-minute bluesy, bluesy music that takes you on a journey. Mm. Just the music alone take, takes you on a journey. It goes slow, and then it speeds up, and it has those it has Jimmy's riffs in it, and then it comes down. You got some of the bottom stuff, that earthy bottom drums, and it is just spectacular to listen to just just i can listen to that over and over again yeah it's so good ccr favorite ccr song um what is it what is the name of the uh it's it's someday never is it someday never comes Someday never comes. So, I think a, that's the name. Of it. Someday. Very special lyrics in that. Beautiful song. Yeah, and I think like as being a parent and stuff, you, mm-hmm. you hear that song in a new way. It's it's just a. Yeah, it's kind of got that like cats in the cradle type of yes. like, you know, like life is short and the like you know they're they're a baby and then they're this you know it, it, it's it's a great song. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic show. Uh, I want to thank you for spending an hour or so smoking cigars and having a drink and talking about who Jeremy McDonald is. Uh, guys, if you haven't tried these and you can see them in your shops, I'm, I know they're in Florida. They're probably in California. Yeah, what there's a little footprint. In? Uh, I mean, Texas, Tennessee, Ohio, uh, Oregon, it's a little footprint all over, not in every state, you know, um, but, uh, you know, give it another six months and I'll open up, you know, the next level of distribution and I'll have some in, in, you know, Chicago and I'll get like, I'll start filling out a little bit more, but it's going to remain small for a while though. Yeah. You know, like, fine. It's all right. So, well, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, I want to thank the, my sponsors for sponsoring the show. And of course, all the viewers uh, now and after they're watching this, um, you got to check out Wildfire Cigars. These are not what you think are just everyday cigars. These are special cigars. <laughs> so, I appreciate that. I appreciate it. that a lot. And hopefully, you can find them. So, with that, I'm going to close out the show. Uh, I hope to see you all uh, next week and till then peace out.